one of the things I never really looked into was the angels. And so please understand, I am just touching the subject. This is, there is so much more that I wish I could make a series out of this because there's plenty to talk about. Now, also what I wanted to do is um, while I was doing research, I looked at many of the Seventh-day Adventist official documents, if you will, and took paragraphs and thoughts from those pages, from those books, from those articles. I wanted to include scripture to all of them because every one of the thoughts that I'll be sharing today can be found in principle in scripture somewhere. But uh, I wasn't able to do that because I realized this is such a large topic that I was able to just bring together my thoughts into the PowerPoint presentation even last night and then uh, realized, wow, this could be a series of meetings. So you'll have to excuse, I'm gonna be doing a lot of reading, but uh, you'll also find that the notes are online. The notes, you can get them it right now if you want to, but I will be presenting them and you'll be able to read them along with me. But at revelationwithdaniel.com, you go to the blog and the very first or latest blog post is the notes from this series called Angels, okay? Angels at Erosi, I think I called it. So, um, there are angels here, right? Yes. There are good and bad angels here. Because you know where the Lord wants to be, the devil shows up too. But uh, before we get going, I'm going to ask a specific thing. I'm going to ask for God's angels, which according to the Bible excel in strength, to be here. And I'm going to ask that at every corner of our location, that we will have and God's angelic ministry keeping back the forces of evil. Okay? Let's pray together, and I'll ask God's blessing uh, through the ministration of his angels. Holy Father, I want to thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here and to hear what it is that you are saying to your church. I pray that you would guide and bless us, that you would lead and inspire us, that you would help us to know and understand what it is that you're saying through the writings of your servants, the prophets. I pray you'd bless us as we continue to think and understand and contemplate what it is that you've shared with us in your word, what it is that your, your angel ministries or ministers are doing. And may it be that our, our minds are clear and pure and true and able to fully understand and comprehend the things that you've got here. As mentioned earlier, I pray that your holy angels will be here amidst our building, amidst our minds, that they would guard us from the evil influences of the enemy, that we can have a time here where we are without distraction, that we are in the presence of your son, yourself, seated on the throne. I ask that you'd please uh, continue to lead and guide that as we're um, learning, it will be to learn to share, that we can expose these things to others. We thank you for this and pray you'd guide in Jesus' name, amen. This is one of the reasons I wanna share about angels. Notice what it says. I call upon ministers of Christ to press home upon the understanding of how many? All who come within the reach of their voice, the truth of the ministration of angels. Amen. Wow, isn't that neat? Amen. So when I read something like that, I realize like this is important for me to share to you because I am a minister of the gospel. I have been ordained by the hands of God's church, given authority to the world really. Um, I was mentioning to my wife, that just this year, my ordination credentials ran out. So I'm no longer an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I have been ordained, and I, uh, I take that seriously. So that's why I'm going to share today. Notice what it says here. The angel messengers will expel sin from the heart. Is that what that says? Well, who does it? Angel messengers will expel sin from the heart. Okay, so do you want the angels around? I do. Here's a good reason why. In fact, watch this. I'm going to put a note right there. I'm going to, I'm going to underline. Angel messengers will expel sin from the heart unless the door of the heart is padlocked and Christ is refused admission. Christ will withdraw himself from those who persist in refusing the heavenly blessings that are so freely offered them. Testimony to ministers. What an incredible, incredible truth. So, angel messengers expel sin from the heart. Huh. I thought that was the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? 
Christ has given authority to his angels, as, as we read in the scripture, who are ministering spirits, to do that work as well. Because I do believe the Holy Spirit has that authority and the ability. But he's extended that over to his angels. That's incredible. Wow. So listen to this one. Temptations often appear irresistible because, through neglect of prayer and study of the Bible, through what? I'm going to mark that one because we need to understand it's through neglect of prayer and the study of the Bible. The tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with scripture weapons. But angels, it says, are round about those who are willing to be taught in divine things. And in the time of great necessity, they will bring to their remembrance the very truths which are needed. Okay, who brings to the remembrance the truths that are needed? It says right there, angels. Angels are round about those who are willing to be taught. And then it says, thus, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, notice quoting Isaiah 59 verse 19, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Ministering spirits are the ones that lift up a standard according to this? Oh yeah. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 59, it says that the spirit of the Lord is the one that lifts up that standard. But when you understand further, you realize it's the angels as well. Incredible. Now I've got a lot to say and I'm going to keep a lot back, but the, the truth is, listen, if you study this stuff for yourself, if you start going into some of the phrases and looking up the phrases that are used in some of these quotes, you realize, wow, there is so much power given to the angels. Notice, while Moses, according to the book of Exodus, while Moses was living in neglect of one of God's positive commands, his life would not be secure. Okay, think about that for a second. While Moses was living in neglect of one of God's positive commands, his life would not be secure. That's profound, isn't it? <clears throat> for God's angels could not protect him while in disobedience. Okay, so if we're in disobedience... Who shows up? The evil angels, right? So if we are in disobedience, if we know we're going against God's obvious commands, we are inviting the evil angels amongst us. Therefore, the angel met him in the way and threatened his life. Okay, so he was going to die because, of course, the angel was trying to educate him. God was being merciful to Moses. I think Moses probably was listening to Eve, or the woman, if you will, his wife. And God was saying, listen man, you can't do this. I'm going to send my angel to show you a sword so you are scared into serving the one who you need to serve. So I think it was merciful that God showed up like an angel of war. Don't you? Therefore the angel met him on the way and threatened his life. He did not explain to Moses why he assumed that threatening aspect. Moses knew that there was a cause. He was going to Egypt according to God's express command. Therefore, the journey was right. He at once remembered that he had not obeyed God in performing the ordinance of circumcision upon his youngest son and had yielded to his wife's entreaties to postpone the ceremony. So he was guilty of listening to his wife just like Adam was guilty of Eve. And there are so many men that listen to their wives today that cause them not to stand up as they should. I got one reaction from, <laughs> from a husband and a wife. I didn't mean to break any, you know, don't break the peace around here. I don't think there's anybody like that in this church. <clears throat> I'm just saying that somewhere, something has like happened that way. After he had obeyed the command of God, he was free to go before Pharaoh, and there was nothing in the way to hinder the ministration of angels in connection with his work. Wow! Are you kidding me? Okay, so when you are following God's will, you can move forward in freedom knowing that you have angelic protection. God's angels. You choose to sin, and you know who's right next to you. It's the enemy. And you better watch out, because God may not be the one holding that sword through one of his angels. It may be the enemy. There have been a lot of times where I've been real close to death. Some of you have heard my testimony, and I'll tell you, God's angels have been real near to me, and I'm sure to you as well. Notice early writings. 
men look like angels. Some of these quotes are going to be kind of random because I didn't, like I said, didn't have enough time to put it all together in, in a clear uh, way. But just every thought take as an individual study. Men looked like angels. Those who lived in the days of Noah and Abraham resembled the angels in form, comeliness, and strength. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? That to me is outstanding. How can you even imagine men looked like angels? Back in the day, of course, they were bigger, they were stronger, they were healthier, they lived longer. They were probably more beautiful than we are today. <laughs> Same concept is from uh, Matthew 22, verse 30. In heaven, we will look like the angels. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. You remember the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, I think it is, or 2? I think it's 2. And also quoted from the Psalms that Christ was made a little lower than the angels? A little lower than the angels, and he became a human. Christ was a little lower than the angels as a human. So it makes sense to me that we can say that, according to our Seventh-day Adventist publications, back in the day, they looked a little bit more like angels than we do today. And it makes good sense to me that we will be like or as the angels in the future. Because right now we're just a little lower than the angels in form, in comeliness, and in strength. Incredible. So had not the Lord made the covering cherub so beautiful, so closely resembling his own image, had not God awarded him special honor, had anything been left undone in the gift of beauty and power and honor, then Satan might have had some excuse. Okay, so I underlined something right there. Notice what that says. So closely resembling his own image. We just read that we're going to be like the angels in heaven, right? And before that, we read that back in the day of Noah and Abraham, they looked a lot more like the angels in comeliness, in strength, and something else. I don't remember. Size, maybe? But here what it's saying is that Lucifer, one of the angels, was so closely made in the image of the sun. So do you, are you saying to me we're going to look like God? You put those thoughts together, and yes, that's the truth. We're going to look a little like God. Of course, because I've done a study in the book of Revelation here, not long ago, in 30 parts. It's at revelationwithdaniel.com. In that study, what I shared was something that I had never thought before. I, I went and did some research and realized that God, according to the Old and New Testament, even before he became a man in the, in the form of a son, uh, in the form of God's son, he came... Rather, when you look at the scripture, you can see that he has a head, he has a face, he has eyes, he has a nose, he has a mouth, he has arms and hands, he has a back, he has legs and feet. God has what you have. You are made in the image of God, more than I think we realize. Now, of course, after 6,000 years of sin, we don't look like God so much anymore, and even we're told that Noah and Abraham look more like the angels, but Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, and one of the angels resembled Christ, of course, he was the covering cherub. We know that there was a difference there. So I don't know how much I can get, how, how close we're going to look like Christ, of course, in heaven. But certainly that is a mind-blowing thought. That Lucifer looked very much like Christ as one of the covering cherubs. Now, Satan will also, again, closely resemble Christ. That's one of his tricks, we know. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception... Satan himself will personate Christ. Doesn't it say it in, I think it's 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, that the angel or the ministers of the enemy show up as angels of light? Remember that? Don't be surprised if even his ministers show up as angels of light or ministers of righteousness. And so it's, it doesn't surprise me that we can say that... Uh, Satan, again, is going to resemble or personate Christ. Of course, in that Revelation series I did, I, I was able to show in Revelation 13, the first part, it's actually 13a, um, 12b and 13a of that series. The Antichrist looks very much like Jesus Christ. 
They both have crowns. They both have horns. They both have a name written on them. They both look like the one before them. They both came up out of the water. They both have names written on them. They both have um, the look of a lion, a bear, and a leopard. They both have a throne. They both have a seat. And they both have been given great authority. They both, etc., etc., etc. In fact, they both were put to death and brought back to life. All the world is wondering after both of them. And they both existed or ministered for 1260 days. It's incredible. All those things you can see right there in the story of the Antichrist of Revelation 13. And we have this idea that the crowning act of this great drama at the end of time, Satan's going to do it even in person. He's going to personally look like Jesus Christ here on this earth. If you don't understand those things from the Bible, you got to start. you got to start studying. If you don't know these things, you are on the road to deception, I promise you. The enemy is not playing games. Some of these things I'm saying we should be able to share with our neighbors at the drop of a hat. Lucifer in heaven before his rebellion was a high and exalted angel. Notice what it says. Next in honor to God's dear son. Okay, wait a minute. Break down the honor system for a minute. Is there anybody more honored than God the Father? Anybody more honored than the Son of God? The, God the Father, right? Next in honor to God's dear Son was who? Notice what it says. Lucifer. Wow, how could that be said? That's amazing. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. So we're going to continue and realize as it uh, goes on, Lucifer was next in honor to Christ. It says the same thing in uh, manuscript 90. Lucifer was the most beautiful angel in the heavenly courts next to Jesus, but Christ was one with God. In fact, uh, Christ was little short of being identical. I didn't include that quote, but you can, you can ask me for it. And I'll send it to you. Little short of being identical with his father. Not identical, little short. So it says, Christ was one with God, assimilated to the image of God to be and to do the will of God. Satan, knowing that Christ had the first place next to God, so there, Satan knows, or Lucifer, who used to be Lucifer, he knew that Christ had the first place next to God. And so we know that Lucifer was next to the Son. He began to insinuate to the angels that he should be next to God. His great beauty and exalted position made him feel that he was not receiving due honor in being second to Christ. So there we, we have it written pretty clearly. God the Father, his son, and then it was Lucifer who wanted the position of Christ, you see. They looked so similar that he figured, well, why aren't I able to go into the councils that are between them both? As it says in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. See? Now, what blew my mind, I, this really blew my mind, right there in... Uh, what is this now? Desire of Ages, page 99.1. Notice what the word is. The words of the angel, I am, who is this? Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, show that he holds a position of high honor in the high, heavenly courts. When he came with a message to Daniel, he said, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, which is Christ, your prince. That'd be Daniel 10, verse 21. Of Gabriel, the Savior speaks in the Revelation, saying, notice the very first verse of Revelation. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. That's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And what's being said here is Gabriel is the one that was sent. Of Gabriel, the Savior speaks in the Revelation. That he's the one that was sent to John to give the Revelation. Okay? Now, what an honor. If you read chapter 1, verse 1 of Revelation, it's the gospel of the Son given by the Father to the Son that the Son gave to the angel that the angel gave to John. And John gives it to everybody else, you see? So as we continue this quote, notice what it says. That's Revelation 1, verse 1. And to John the angel declared, I am thy fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren the prophets. Revelation 22, verse 9. Wonderful thought that the angel who stands next in honor to the Son of God is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. Okay, did you just hear that? 
Gabriel instead of Lucifer, who became Satan after the fall, after his rebellion. Now it's, what'd you say? Took his place. Lucifer lost his place. Gabriel took his place. And the angel Gabriel who gave the revelation to John is the one who stands second in honor or next in honor to the Son of God and is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. Wow. You see, what's interesting about this is in the story of redemption, have you ever read that book? How many of you have read that book, Story of Redemption? Okay, there's a few of you, but I encourage you, please, in the name of Jesus, pick up that book, young and old. This book is awesome, yes. It talks about the angels in such a way that that's what actually started this, this study. Is like, I listened to that book and just, wow, this is incredible. The angels are so powerful. If you go through that book, you realize the ministration of the angels is far greater than what I had ever thought. So maybe some of you understand this. I was talking to Daniel Taves earlier, and he was like, oh yeah, the angels, they do the work of the Holy Spirit much of the time. I'm like, I never knew that. That's amazing. I said that to my mother too. I was like, can you know the angels do this? And she's like, yeah, I've known that all the time. I'm like, well, what? A, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> so this is, this is good stuff. Anyways, right there, Gabriel now. Who's next in honor? God the Father, the Son, and then... Gabriel, third most highest being in all of heaven. Incredible. Now, when you go to the story of redemption, you realize this, this right here. After his transgression, which is man, this his right there is man, okay? So after his transgression, God would communicate to man through what? Or through who? Christ and angels. Okay, through Christ and angels. So wait a minute. That's right after the fall of man. Think about... Um, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, when you read about that in Genesis 18, verses 20 through 19, verse 1, you realize it says, The Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all according to the cry of it, which is common to me. And if not, I will know. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place and there came two angels to Sodom at even. So <clears throat> if you know the story, how many were there that were with the Lord that came down from heaven? Two. And how many were there altogether? Three. So we know that Christ very often in the Old Testament is called the angel of the Lord. And he had two angels with him. That's three angels that went to um, Sodom and Gomorrah to call destruction upon the inhabitants there. Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, sounds a lot like three angels telling the world that there's going to be destruction on the inhabitants there. And so I did a series of, uh, in fact, I presented that, that message here at this church, I believe it was, um, the three angels in Genesis, or maybe it was, I don't know, somewhere. Anyways, you can go and find that at Revelation with Daniel. It's a sermon that you can find there. If you can't find it, send me a contact through that website, and I'd love to share it with you because I think there's a lot of good insight there in that presentation. Now, <clears throat> Patriarchs and Prophets says, through holy angels, God revealed to Enoch. Okay, through holy angels, God revealed to Enoch, who was a prophet, his purpose is to destroy the world by a flood. Now, would that be current or future events? The destruction of the world by a flood. Okay, so future events. Through holy angels, God revealed the future to Enoch about destroying the world by a flood. And he also opened more fully to him the plan of redemption. Okay, so he explained the plan of God's purposes in salvation to Enoch through angels. <laughs> wow. By the spirit of prophecy, he, God, carried Enoch down through angels, but also through the generations that should live after the flood and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. Okay, wait. So are you saying to me, according to this quote, that holy angels gave to Enoch the spirit of prophecy? You all know this, don't you? That was new to me, like not too long ago. It's like, whoa, but I've read this, this next uh, Scripture so many times, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. I, John, fell at his feet, the angel, to worship him. And he said unto me, don't do this. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that 
have the testimony of Jesus. Don't worship us that have the testimony of Jesus, those that have been sent by God. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the angel said, hey, don't worship me. I have the spirit of prophecy. I'm one of your brothers. In Revelation 22, it says, I'm, I'm one of the prophets. Okay, Don't worship me, worship God. And so, yes, it would be consistent for patriarchs and prophets to say of Enoch that angels gave Enoch the spirit of prophecy to talk about the end of the world. Amazing. So, yeah, well, that makes sense because who came to the man at the banks of Uli? Daniel. I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, who is it? Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Gabriel was told to give the revelation of prophecy and an understanding of the end of the days. The prophecy of the 2300 years, he was told to give that revelation to Daniel through Gabriel. Did I, I must have messed that up, but you understand. Gabriel's the one that was given the command to share the spirit of prophecy with Daniel. I just learned something from uh, Dr. Edward Reed a short time ago. I never had, had considered this before. <clears throat> when you look up the word Gabriel, it only occurs four times in all of Scripture. Twice, I believe it is, in Daniel, dealing with the prophecy of the 2300 days, and more specifically the 490, in chapter 8 and 9. And then you find it in the New Testament, where Gabriel is told that Christ is coming to the earth to, of course, help fulfill that prophecy that he talked to Daniel about. <clears throat> so Gabriel being named as an angel is kind of a clue that helps us understand a little bit more about what the 490 years is in Daniel 8 and 9. So I thought that was neat. Okay, <clears throat> Gabriel, of course, foretold the Messiah's birth. His birth was a miracle of God, for said the angel, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall I be, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, Prophecy, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and give the power of the highest I'm sorry, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. This is Gabriel. He's speaking to Mary and he's prophesying. Remember, he's the one that said, I am of thy brethren, the prophets. I have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Angels are prophets just as much as men are prophets on earth. Women are prophets on earth. It's incredible. I've never, never understood that until just a short time ago. Now, this is amazing. A angels render divine help. This is actually the second sentence of the book, Testimonies to Ministers. This is talking about Christ. While he extends to all the world his invitation to come to him and be saved, he commissions his angels to render, notice, divine help to every soul that comes to him in repentance and contrition. And he comes personally by his Holy Spirit into the midst of his church. That sentence is so big. Okay, so <clears throat> he extends to all the world. Is anybody left out of that extended invitation? No. He, ex he extends to all the world his invitation to come to him and be saved, to render divine help to, what is that word? Every soul. Every soul. So every single person that comes to Christ in two, thing, two things here, repentance and contrition, he sends divine help to those people through his angels. And he comes personally by his Holy Spirit. This is talking about Christ. Christ is the one that comes personally by his Holy Spirit into the midst of his church. That is such a profound sentence. Notice this one is, is amazing too. Angels were expelled from heaven because... They would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves, kind of like the Antichrist system, right? 
they forgot that their beauty and person of character came from the Lord Jesus. Notice what they tried to do. This fact, the angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. One angel began the controversy and carried it on until there was rebellion in the heavenly courts among the angels. They were lifted up because of their beauty. What fact did they try to obscure? What does it say? That Christ was the only begotten Son of God. See, they didn't like that idea. They tried to break that thought. They tried to obscure or confuse the truth about Christ being the only begotten Son of God. That was the the work of the enemy angels. That was not the work of God's angels. That was what the whole controversy was over. Angels are watching with intense interest to see how man is dealing with his fellow men. Notice what they do. When they see one, these are angels, when they see one manifest Christ-like sympathy for the erring, they press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that will be as the bread of life to the soul. Now remember what it says? They press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that will be as the bread of life to the soul. Wait a minute, doesn't it say that you're not to worry about what you're to say before kings and counselors and people like that? Because who is it that brings to your mind things? It's the Holy Spirit, right? Here, we're told that the angels bring to your memory those things that you need to say. This is during, of course, the time that you're uh, trying to win those that are lost. So, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Your testimony and its genuineness and reality will be, or he will, make powerful in the power of the life to come. The word of the Lord will be in your mouth as truth and righteousness. This is by the help of the angels. This is, I think, incredible. And we're going to, I didn't write it down, but I've thought about it since. There's a scripture I'll tell you about. Notice, through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is, what is that word? Enabled. Enabled. I'm going to just do that one time like this so that I don't cross out the word, but enabled. What does that mean? If you're not enabled, can you do something? No. Okay, so how can the Holy Spirit do work? Through the ministration of the angels. Wow, wait a minute. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent. That sounds like the work of the Spirit. It is. But it's through the ministration of the angels that the Holy Spirit is enabled. Right? Wow! I never understood these things until I started reading and trying to understand what is the word of the Lord saying. So it says... They will work upon the mind and heart. So that's what you'd think the work of the Holy Spirit is, but it's given to the ministration of the angels. And they will draw him to Christ, who had paid the ransom money for his soul, that the sinner may be rescued from the slavery of sin and Satan. But the Spirit of God does not interfere with the freedom of the human agent. The Holy Spirit is given to be a helper, so that the human agent may cooperate with the divine intelligences, which are angels. And it is its providence to draw the soul but never to force obedience. Okay, so that quote is to me absolutely amazing. The ministration of the holy angels. Now, okay, so I told you I didn't include one of the scriptures, but think about it this way. Go in your mind to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It talks about the four angels holding back the four winds of strife that that are basically beating upon the earth, right? You remember this. We always talk about the angels holding back the winds of strife. Why are they doing that? So that the servants of God can be sealed in their foreheads. And how are they sealed? And by what are they sealed? By the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is able to put the seal of God upon the saints on the earth because the angels are holding back the four winds. It's right there. I never saw it. Not until I started reading these kind of things and I was like, wow, that's amazing, incredible. So through the ministration of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to continue on his work as he does. Do not speak sharply to the evildoer. This is when you're witnessing. 
or discourage a soul who is struggling with the powers of darkness. Be still and let your heart ascend in prayer to God for helpers, or for help rather. Angels will come close to your side and help you to lift up the standard against the enemy. And instead of cutting off the erring one, you may be enabled to gain a soul for Christ. Again, angels will lift up the standard, which according to Isaiah 59 is a work that the Spirit does. Again, angels are commissioned to work as do, as does the Holy Spirit. And here's that quote again. I think I referred to it earlier, or at least it was in one of the quotes. Isaiah 59, verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So, but, but listen to this next one. Angels actually make impressions upon minds. As you speak the words I give you, angels of heaven will be with you to make impressions on the minds of those who hear. You see why I was asking so diligently in my prayer that angels would be here amongst us? That we'd be able to have their protection against the wily darkness of the evil one? In fact, there's one that I hope I included about angels wafting their wings. I love that quote. Notice this one, angels at the end of time. The heavenly sentinels faithful to their trust, continue their watch. Some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as a straw. Kind of like in the days of Esther. They, you know, the people of the enemy didn't have the ability to kill those that were on God's side. Others are defended by angels, notice, in the form of men of war. Angels are in the form of men of war? You mean like the SWAT team? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Men of war today, because we're still talking about the future, right? They are fully dressed in technology, in bulletproof vests, in helmets, with painted faces, with grenades and shotguns and, you know, machine guns and hand rifles, you know, hand pistols, etc. <clears throat> so you're telling me angels are going to show up like men of war? That's what it says. Amazing. Because we know in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, what is it, the first one of like verse 3 or something? They were supposed to um, be careful to entertain strangers. For some of us might entertain angels without knowing it. They come to us as men, as women. I think sometimes as animals too. They probably use those. I'm sure they do, like in the cock crowing and in the, the donkey with Balaam. Notice in Desire of Ages, I don't remember ever reading this one, though I know I have. They are to contend with supernatural forces, that is, the Christians. But they are assured of supernatural help. Amen. All the intelligences of heaven are in this army. And more than angels are in the ranks. The Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host. So the Holy Spirit comes down to direct the battle. Our infirmities may be many, our sins and mistakes grievous, but the grace of God is for all who seek it with contrition. Remember those that are contrite, the Lord sends to every soul the ministration of the angels to render divine help. The power of omnipotence is enlisted in behalf of those who trust in God. So this one to me is, is incredible because <clears throat> you wonder, why would the Holy Spirit come down to direct the battle? According to the writings of our church, it's pretty clear to me that Christ, he couldn't be everywhere at one time. Therefore, he said in John chapter 14 through 16, it is expedient that I leave you so that I can go to my father and I'll send you, as she says, the gift or the donation of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I will send that to you. And in that same paragraph, it's explained, he, Christ, through his spirit, is, wants to be known as the omnipresent. Okay? He's omnipresent through his spirit. So why, if Christ is omnipresent through his spirit, does he use angels? That's, that's one of the things I've wondered. But I believe I understand at least a little bit about it. You see, <clears throat> there is what we understand in the future called a judgment, right? Right? where everybody will be judged according to the works that they've done, whether they be good or whether they be evil. 
the enemy's in the judgment too, because Christ, through one of his prophets, Paul, said, don't you know that you are going to judge angels? Okay, so we're going to be involved in judging who? Angels. All right. So now, if the angels stand up in the judgment, and they're like, you know what? That guy, I know I tempted. And he's here on the other side. He's, he's safe, and I'm condemned? Everybody's like, yep. Well, wait a minute. If it was the work of the Holy Spirit only and without angels, the angel would be able to say, I don't know what happened in the mind of that man. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. I couldn't see it. You see, because now God, I think playing on equal grounds, has the Holy Spirit directing the battle of the angels. So that the angels are there and they can say, you know what, I'm a witness. Let all, be, let all things be done in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I'm a witness. I was with that man when he chose. Yes, the Holy Spirit was working, but so was I. And I can attest that he, that was the decision that he made at that time. He's right. And the fallen angel's like, mm. <laughs> right? Well, because he has to go to the hot place. So I believe what's happening is because the devil doesn't have omnipresence, and it wouldn't be fair if God, through his omnipresence, did all the ministry through his people without that ability that the enemy has. The enemy would be able to cry out in the judgment, unfair! So what I think is happening is we're seeing a little bit of the fact that God is playing on fair grounds. Why did Christ have to become a man? Because he wants to save men. Fair grounds. Right? We can go into this all through. This is, there's a lot of this. But see, what I'm, what I'm understanding is the Holy Spirit is using the angels as a commander of the army. Just like the enemy is using his angels as his, his being the commander of his army. And they both have angels with a general, if you will. And so in the judgment, it will be fair ground for everybody who chooses. Every single one of us will have chosen to follow the influence of righteousness or the influence of evil. And it will have been through the ministration of angels. And our own choices. So I, I think it means that because God uses the angels, I believe it's because he needs witnesses in the judgment. Doesn't it say in Daniel chapter 7 that there are 10,000s times 10,000s sitting before him? Those are witnesses. A great cloud of witnesses, which of course are the testimony of the spirits of uh, prophecy. Or the spirit of prophecy. Angels going up and down on the ladder. Notice what it says in Genesis and also John. He that Jacob dreamed with a stone for a pillow. Behold, a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Later, Jesus picked this up and he said, He saith unto him, which is Nathanael, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the ladder, the Son of Man. See? So notice this next quote from First Selected Messages, 96.2. The angelic angels are messengers from heaven, <clears throat> actually ascending and descending. This is what really happens. Keeping earth in constant co connection with the heaven above. Doesn't it say in Matthew chapter 18, my father always, or rather these angels always see the face of my father in heaven. If you offend one of these little ones, you're going to be dealing with it because the angels know. That's what Jesus was saying. These angel messengers are observing all our course of action. They are ready to help in all their weaknesses, guarding from all all moral and physical danger, according to the providence of God. And whenever souls yield to the softening, subduing influence of the Spirit of God under these angel ministrations. Okay, so wait a minute. There is a subduing influence of the Spirit of God under these angel ministrations. There is joy in heaven. The Lord himself rejoices with singing. Wow. The Holy Spirit is brought to people through the ministration of the angels. Amen. Amen. That's amazing. I never knew these things. So, watch this one. The angels of God are ever moving up and down from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. 
Okay, what's this word? All the miracles of Christ. How many? All the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. All the blessings of God to man are through the ministration of holy angels. <laughs> are you kidding me? Would we be... Uh, we would be the worst if every time we prayed, we neglected to pray for the ministration of the angels. We constantly pray for the Holy Spirit, which is good. I think we should because the Holy Spirit is who we need. Christ's representative. But we also need the ministration of the angels because they are the chosen vehicle by which God has given blessings, all blessings to mankind. I, I just want to read that one again. All the miracles of Christ, all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. Here's that one about wafting the wings. Angels were having the charge over the people of God. And as the poisonous atmosphere of these evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the angels, which had the charge over them, were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness that surrounded them. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Sometimes you need a cool breeze when it's just hot out there, right? Sometimes you just need spiritual light when there's darkness. And those angels can come and just waft their wings, powerful wings. And that's why I chose to put those wings behind the picture there. Because God is just able to waft the angel wings and dispel all the darkness. I like that. If God would send his angels to them to waft their wings, to scatter the darkness, that they may see a little ray of light. Amen. That their eyes would be open and they'll be able to say, wow, I've never thought of that before. Well, good. Angels keep going. Keep going. Stay there. Right? Do you like that? I love that. It's so beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so who is the greatest power on earth? Watch this. While Satan was striving to influence the highest powers in the kingdom of Medo-Persia to show disfavor to God's people, angels worked in behalf of those people, the exiles. The controversy was one in which all heaven was interested. Through the prophet Daniel, we are given a glimpse of this mighty struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For three full weeks, according to Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel wrestled with the power of darkness, seeking to counteract the influences at work in the mind of Christ. I'm sorry, Cyrus. And before the contest closed, Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. <coughs> so you know what this is saying to me? All the powers on earth, which were evil angels, were forcing their agenda. All the angels on earth, which was Gabriel and all the other angels, were forcing God's agenda. Right? You work, you're working with me here? So Cyrus is in the middle trying to decide what he's going to do. And all the evil angels and all the good angels are there in a gridlock. For three weeks they are pushing against each other and something's about to explode, but it doesn't. They just keep pressing and pressing and trying to get to Cyrus and they can't get there. So Gabriel cries out, Christ, Michael, I need your help. And so Michael comes down and boom. That gives me chills. <laughs> God is powerful. Amen. Oh, watch this. <clears throat> From the two olive trees. Ah, I'm shaken up by that one. Excuse me. From the two olive trees, <clears throat> the golden oil was emptied through golden pipes into the bowl of the candlestick and thence into the golden lamps. That gave light to the sanctuary. So, from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, his spirit is imparted to human instrumentalities that are consecrated to his service. Okay, let's think about that for a second. Are you kidding me? So, from the two olive trees, golden oil was emptied through the golden pipes. Okay? So, or in the same manner, from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, which are angels. His spirit is imparted to human instrumentalities that are consecrated to his service. The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate light and power to God's people. This one continues. It is to receive blessing 
for us that they stand in God's presence. As the olive trees empty themselves into the golden pipes, so the heavenly messengers <clears throat> seek to communicate all that they receive from God. The whole heavenly treasure awaits our demand and reception. And as we receive the blessing, we in our turn are to impart it. Thus, it is that the holy lamps are fed and the church becomes a bearer of light in the world. <laughs> so according to Zechariah chapter 4, from whence we get the idea of the two olive trees or branches, what we're seeing there is those branches that actually carry the oil that extends over to the lampstand that fills it so it can burn, those are angels. And we as a church are represented by those bulls. That's what we see in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 because the seven lamps that are burning there, those are representative of the churches. Okay, So that in Testimonies to Ministers, page 510, is mind expanding. I was going to say mind blowing, but my son just reminded me the other day. I don't like that phrase so much. The presentation is over. Um, some of my thoughts were just as it reads. The angels of God are incredible. They're powerful. God made them so. He appointed them to be there for us, to minister to and with us. Look at my dear sister Carla. I can think of the scripture in Matthew 24. Thinking about my mother and my father. My mother also lost her husband years ago. God is going to send his angels to call forth those that have been resurrected to bring them to Christ. Amen. Angels. What an honor. Can you imagine how happy the angels will be? Wow. You get to see your husband again, or your, in my case, my father. Some good friends I've lost in the past that are Christian. You're going to be re reunited. Why? How? Through the ministration of angels. And I'm telling you, the more we understand the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, the more a revival will be in our lives, Amen. the more we will love and serve our master, and the more we will be prepared as the 144,000 that Christ will come and take Amen. in the harvesting of this earth's future final history. So I want to ask that you guys would continue to study, learn these things, know them for yourselves. And share them, okay? Let's, would, you, would you bow with me and we'll pray? Holy Father, it's good to look at what you've revealed. You amaze us. I so want to be able to see into the dimension wherein the angel, angels live. I wish that they would draw near to us here, all through our lives, draw near to our families and friends, our loved ones, help us to make them happy, that they can bring good news to heaven, because we know you see too much bad news. We ask that you'd please continue to help us to understand more fully what the scripture and the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy are saying to your church. We know you're coming soon, Father. We know you're revealing a lot of truth to your people. And we ask that you'd help us to accept those truths and move forward with them with power. The power that's described in Revelation 18, the first few verses. We commit ourselves to you today, <clears throat> asking that you would please use us in the greatest extent possible to share your love with those around us. Forgive us for we fail. Empower us so that we don't. Thank you in Jesus' name.